So um, basically, we ask questions such as why do people get kidney disease, why do people get osteoporosis, and we try and figure out ways of answering those questions. And using mouse genetics is one way of answering those questions. Uh, it's not the only way, as Sarah mentioned, there are human studies, and we interact very closely with clinicians and people doing human studies. Um, just to highlight one of the problems with human studies, this is the family tree of Queen Victoria. The people in boxes are people affected by haemophilia. So you can track their, the genomics of all these offspring, all these children, and follow the family history and work out what gene causes haemophilia. Great, but to do that, you have to get all these people to agree, which isn't that easy. People don't like being taken part. Even if it's a simple test like spitting into a tube or taking a blood sample, you have to find out the entire family history, what environmental, whether they exercise, what food they eat, and look at the length of time from Queen Victoria down. It's six, seven generations potentially hundreds of years to figure out what's going on just in this one disease. So it is feasible and it is done, but it's not easy. The other thing that Sarah mentioned was the genome-wide association studies. Now this is taking large groups of patients and large groups of controls, so that's people that are normal, so-called, um, but it is large. If you think of the variation in this room, the different food you eat, the different exercise regimes, your different family backgrounds, your, 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 where you live, the, all, all those environmental factors play a role in what just diseases you're susceptible to. Um, and a disease will result from a combination of many of these factors, not just the genetics. So really it's very difficult to control for all these environmental factors. And the other problem is, you only find out when somebody's sick when they're sick. It's quite hard to predict when somebody is going to be sick. So there are programs where we're following patients of general populations through their medical notes, through their entire life cycle. But again, for a human being, that can be now 100 years, quite easily now. Um, so it's complex, but there are results coming out of these studies, and we, do, we are making use of them. But why do we use mice? Well, here's an example. My, as, as was mentioned in the introduction, one of my interests is in the genetics of ageing. What causes age-related disease? Now, everybody gets old, but some people are susceptible to diseases in old age uh, more than others. Things like osteoporosis, deafness, retinal degeneration leading to blindness, Alzheimer's, diabetes, obesity. These are huge um, public problems, and they're all age-related. Now, a lot of research in, uh, was kicked off in age-related disease in C. elegans. So that's a worm. It's a microscopic worm. They identified genes that increase the lifespan of these worms. This work was continued in yeast and in Drosophila, Drosophila fruit fries. So they're models. But as you can see from these, these are some of the diseases that humans are susceptible to. Fruit flies and worms don't get the same diseases. They're not, a, not as complex an organism as human beings are. The reason mice are good, model, uh, are, are good models of disease is because they're susceptible to many of the same diseases. Almost all the diseases humans get, mice get. They have kidneys, they have lungs, they, they go blind, they go deaf, they get osteoarthritis, all things like that. That's why we use them as a model and because of our understanding of the genetics and the way we can manipulate the genome. And all this is done to answer the questions about human disease. So just to recapitulate, mice have, we've got to define genetic backgrounds. So we've removed one of the major problems in human studies. They're all the same. So we know if one mouse gets a disease and another one doesn't, there's, there's a difference in their, in their genome. We can control their environment. It's very difficult to say to people, you're only allowed to eat this food for the rest of your life. You can't have chocolate bars because we want to study or not whether you get fat or not. Um, like I say, we have an in-depth knowledge of their genetics and their biology, and we can cross-compare. We're perfectly aware that a mouse is not a person. It never will be a person. It's only ever a model. 
and we, we, that is factored into all our research. It's never going to be a perfect example of a human disease, but in many, many cases, they're very, very close, and we can gain a lot of understanding from them. Now, I want to go through one example of some of the research going on at Harwell. Uh, um, one of the key examples is glue ear, otitis media. Anybody had glue ear or nobody had, knows somebody that had glue ear? Yeah, it's an incredibly common disease. 90-odd percent of children under the age of three will have an episode of glue ear. The vast majority of people, they get an infection, they get a bit of inflammation in their middle ear, and it goes away. But for a lot of children, it comes back, or it doesn't resolve. And the only uh, treatment is surgery. So, but to give you an idea of what's known about it, uh, like I say, it's very common. It can be very mild, it can resolve immediately, and it can, but it can also go as a lifelong disease. It will be a chronic disease throughout their life that they can't get rid of. Uh, you go, as a child, you lose a bit of hearing. OK, it's not that bad. But actually, you lose your hearing at a developmental stage when you're starting to talk. You're learning language. So you can actually have a lifelong impact, just a, a six-month bout of hearing loss, because your development is affected. You're, you're behind the rest of your class, classmates, and you're, you, you struggle for the rest of your life. It is inco very common. 2.2 million episodes of this in the US. The estimated cost just in the US alone, not the rest of the world, is $4 billion. So although it's a very mild disease, you know, it won't kill you, it is a, a large cost and affects a lot of people. Um, and they think that the chronic disease, the lifelong disease, could affect anywhere between 60 and 300 million people across the world. So it's an important disease. And basically what happens is, this is your middle ear. So that there is your eardrum. That's the canal going out to your outer ear. And in, in a normal person, you've got your eustachian tube here, which is the link to the throat, and then these bones that conduct the sound. So the sound waves hit this eardrum, the eardrum moves, these bones move, and that movement is then converted into what you perceive as hearing. In otitis media, this middle ear space is filled with inflammatory cells. It's completely blocked. And you can basically you lose your hearing. Your, your, these bones won't move. It can sound a bit like you've just got out of the swimming pool and you've got water in your ear to an almost complete loss of hearing, which, as I said, as a toddler, as a two-year-old when you learn to speak, can have significant effects for the rest of your life. So how do we treat it? Well, because we don't know what causes it, treating it is quite difficult. There's a lot of association with a bacterial infection. Most children get it. They'll get a bit of a fever, they'll get a bit of a snotty nose, they get a bit of glue ear, and then it resolves. So it does seem to be associated with disease, with a, a bacterial or viral infection. But for decades they've been researching this. We can't actually find what bacteria or pin it down. Is it associated with infection? And, more importantly, the chronic disease doesn't always have bacteria in it. It can, it can continue without, uh, you know, rounds and rounds of infection. So because it's associated with um, bacteria, they give lots and lots of antibiotics. Now, can you antibiotics like sweets is, a, is not a good thing. As you may have read from the press, um, MRSA, bacterial, uh, drug-resistant bacteria, are a bad thing. So we try and limit, uh, the clinicians try and limit how much um, antibiotics are prescribed. And it's not that effective. So it costs a lot of money to give these kids. There are no antibiotics. It's a risk to society in the general, and it doesn't work that well. The only known treatment that works relatively effectively, but even then is not a cure, is the placement of a grommet in the eardrum. Now, it's the most common cause of surgery in children, I think, of under the age of five. Surgery in children is not a good thing. There's always a risk with any surgery of infection um, under the anaesthetic, and it's stress to the family and the children. Now, a grommet is simply a tube that they push through the eardrum, and it allows the fluid to drain out. They don't know how it works, but it seems to work in a lot of cases, but some people have to go through multiple rounds, and it means you can't go swimming, the tubes drop out, you have to have them replaced, and things like that. And 
it costs money. You know, that, um, for, you, know you know the situation we're in at the moment. Every, we have to look at ways of reducing costs. Obviously not affecting people's health, but this is a high cost and a high risk to children. So there's a big question. What causes OM? Why, why do some people get it and get over it and others have it for the rest of their lives and have to go through multiple rounds of surgery? So human studies, one way of looking at human, uh, the, the effect of genetics. So the question was, is it bacterial infection or is it genetics? Um, one way is twin studies and triplet studies. Because twins are genetically identical, if they both get the same disease, there's probably quite a strong genetic component. Um, and the estimate from lots of human studies was a, about a 70% genetic component. There's also quite a racial variation. Some um, racial groups seem to be more prone to OM than others. So that, again, hints at um, genetics. And also, Down syndrome um, is strongly associated, associated with glue ear. Uh, there, there was a sort of story that came out that it might be a, 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 the way your shape, uh, the shape of your face and the shape of your ear so that your middle ear can't drain properly and that's why people are more susceptible to OM, but it never really got anywhere and was never really proved. So the key, one of the key successes we had at Harwell was identifying not one or two, but we've got now three and potentially four different mouse strains that develop otitis media. And immediately this has told us a lot about the genetics of OM. So first off, these, that's a, a, an affected mouse, that's a normal mouse. Well, they're a bit smaller. The other strains aren't smaller, but they, they all get OM spontaneously. One of the first things, these, this is what the middle ear looks like. It's full of these inflammatory cells, absolutely packed. It's a, it's a bit like pus. It's that sort of, that sort of stuff, uh, hence why it's called glue. It's all gloopy. This brown staining... This is a chemical you can label the cells with. And what this is telling us is that the middle ear, these cells are hypoxic. So that means there's a lack of oxygen in, in the middle ear. Now, one of the real questions was, if people are, are prone to this inflammatory disease, why do they only get it in their middle ear? Why is that so special? Why don't they get it anywhere else? Um, and it turns out from these studies, the middle ear seems to be hypoxic. It does, it's not oxygenated very well. And this may interact with the genetics to, to result in inflammation just in the middle ear. The second thing that is very important, none of these mice have any craniofacial um, abnormalities. They're normal mice. So it looks like it's not a craniofacial thing. It's not the way your shape is faced. Uh, your face is shaped. It's the genetics. One of the most important things is because of the health status of these mice, these mice are checked continuously for um, infectious organisms. We know they don't have any bacteria. We, don't, we know they don't have any viral infections. And in fact, we've put one of these mice into an environment where there, there has no microbiology, bi biological organisms at all. Um, and they still get OM. So there's a clear genetic link now. We've shown that genetics can lead to OM. It's not um, only infection. And with three genes, we've mapped the genes in three of them and are looking at the fourth potentially now. Um, identifying the gene tells you one thing. OK, this gene's associated with disease. But you can then actually start working out pathways. What do those genes interact? And because we've got three of them, do they all interact with the same pathway? So if we can start identifying pathways up and, up and down from those genes, we can start maybe saying, OK, well, if that pathway is affected, how can we modulate that pathway and help the disease? Um, one of the genes we've taken, we found the gene in the mouse, and now we've started looking specifically in humans. And actually, in the human studies, because they never looked at this gene um, before, they've now looked at it, and it is linked to OM. So it looks like one of our mouse models is validated. It seems that humans have a similar problem to these mice. So we're now starting to understand human disease a bit more. So like I say, because we can identify pathways, we can start identifying treatments. We don't just throw random drugs at animals and hope something works. We've identified a pathway, and one of those pathways is a pathway 
that responds to a lack of oxygen. So the ear has a lack of oxygen. We've got three genes, two of which we know interact with the same pathway that responds to a lack of oxygen. So can we modulate that pathway? So it's a bit of a complex slide, but it's actually quite simple. So this, along the bottom, the longer the bar, the deafer the mouse is, which means it's got more OM. In red are the normal mice. In green are the mice that spontaneously get OM. And in blue, the mice are treated with various drugs that we know interact with this pathway. And as you can see, we've identified a number of drugs that can modulate this disease. So the hearing improves, the inflammation goes down, um, and the disease appears to be improved. Now, I'm not going to claim we're gonna, we can now go out and give people these drugs and cure OM. This is just the first stage. There's a pathway that we know, there's a pathway we can potentially modify, but we have to look at the dosage. It's no good if we have to give people these drugs continuously for the rest of their lives. Ideally, what we'd like to is to treat them and cure them without supplying them with drugs for the rest of their lives, because drugs have side effects. So it's, but this is, this is a first stage, it's a very exciting stage. It's the first time um, that a drug that isn't an antibiotic has, shown to, has been shown to modulate disease, uh, modulate OM. So what else are we doing? Now, because we know the pathways are involved, we can start doing more detailed studies. So leaving aside the mice, we're looking at individual cells. How, how are those pathways affected in, in individual cells? Um, we're looking at further DNA changes. Are, can we find other genes associated with disease, either from human studies or from mouse studies? What is the effect of bacteria? Does it make the disease worse? Because these mice don't have bacteria, OK, what is the interaction? If you get bacteria, does the disease get worse? Do they not affect it at all? All those sorts of questions have been asked. And also, drug therapies, like I said, like I showed you. We're identifying drugs that can modulate disease, but not only drugs that modulate diseases, how do we deliver them? I wouldn't, you know, people don't want injections in their middle ear and we want a way of delivering a drug to the right place in your ear. You don't want to take pills all your life. And so we're, because we're based on a physics um, institute next door, we're actually talking with a physicist that's doing a lot of nanotechnology. So can we package up these drugs and deliver them in a specific way that will cure OM in the mice? Once we start showing it works in the mice, we can then go on to human studies. And the ultimate aim is to develop a non-surgical intervention. So we can give children a course of drugs, alleviate their OM, they won't have to go through surgery, their development isn't, isn't um, held up. Um, and again, you know, I don't like the word cure, but certainly alleviate the disease. So just to summarise, what have we learned from, this is just one disease that we're investigating at Harwell. Um, what have we learned so far? Well, there is a strong genetic effect. We've shown that. You can modulate the genome and get OM in these mice. And we're, we're in constant contact and have a joint project with people looking in human disease. So we're taking their information and looking in our, in our mice, and ta they're taking our information and looking in their human studies. Infection doesn't seem to be essential for the development of this disease. That's a new story. Um, and we know that because our mice are clean. We know the health status, which is always difficult to prove in, in humans. Because, again, the classic problem with humans is you only get to them once they're sick. So you don't know whether the bacteria in their ear are there after the disease or before the disease. Um, the lack of oxygen in the middle ear ex might explain how the grommets work. It's always been assumed that they allowed the, air, the, the fluid to drain out, which improved your hearing. But actually what it might be doing is letting oxygen in to an area where there's not much, much oxygen. And we know these genes that are affected in the mice interact with that pathway. So the oxygen may down-regulate the inflammation. So we're looking at that. And again, we're looking at that in vitro, so in, the, in a dish, in a tissue culture, because we've identified this in the mouse. And also we've started to identify drugs. The drugs we've identified may not be 
suitable today to give to a human, but that's, that's, what we're, that's the ultimate aim. We've identified a pathway, we've identified a class of drugs that can potentially modulate disease. And really, this is the ultimate aim of everything we do, is a better understanding of, of, of disease, and not simply just human. <laughs> most, most animals get these diseases as well. The, a lot of the, the drugs are developed for uh, veterinary work as well. Um, but it's a constant circle, getting information from human studies, applying it to our research, and taking our research and talking to clinicians. Most of the, the collaborations we've got are um, with clinical scientists or pure clinicians. They don't know about the genetics of mice. We don't deal with patients, but by talking to each other, we, we hope to understand and um, develop better treatments for people. I think that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you.